what we know, what we're qualified to do. Tells the world whether we're intelligent or not. Tells the world what kind of skills that we have. So credentials are a form of personal validation for us uh, when we go out into the, to the world. But as the ancestors said, we have to distinguish between the real and the unreal when we're dealing with credentials, when we're dealing with um, what validates us and what doesn't validate mm -hmm. us. We, we have the assumption that credentials produce or are responsible for our mobility in this society. And they are, uh, to some degree. Of course, when we look at the statistics, we see that they benefit some people more than they benefit us. But they are supposed to allow us access Sort of like a, a trade union or the um, skills that you acquire going through certain technical courses allow you into particular areas, but that's very political because you have to get through that school. You have to get through those courses, and the people who are responsible for those courses, they know who's supposed to get through. To me, it's, it's amazing how we don't, because it becomes real personal and maybe we know somebody who did get through we don't understand mm -hmm. Europeans as a nation. Mm -hmm. We understand you don't have to have a conversation because it's understood. Those people don't rise, or those people don't rise so far. That's not to say that we don't have quote unquote successes. I think I'm pretty successful. I know my is pretty successful. But in the bigger picture, in the scheme of things, there's a reason why our incomes in general are less, our occupational prestige is less, all of these things are less. So they know that when you come into this, this coke bottle, into this queue to maybe acquire those skills, they know that their job is to make sure that the vast majority of you do not make it through because you're going to be taking money out of their brothers and sisters' hands. That's, that's understood, and we don't, we don't seem to uh, get that. We imagine that this is a real, fair, honest system of um, credentials, and, and if we could just get those credentials, even if we get those credentials, the studies show that a black man who has a college degree has a lower average income than a white male who dropped out of high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are statistics that they compile. Okay, this, isn't, this isn't us compiling. This is statistics that they compile. So when we, when we understand that, when we look at the bigger pictures, then uh, we, can, we can see um, better. Uh, so the problem here. The, I guess for me the problem here is twofold. The problem, the problem is that we don't understand who's validating us. We don't understand who these credentials come through. Who says that they're okay? Somebody has to okay this. Mm -hmm. and we don't okay this. Even at our schools, we don't okay this because we have to be accredited and certified by them. That's the number one problem for me. We're not the ones who are validating us. And you look to whoever's validating you for everything. You can pretend that you're operating in your own world, but you worry about their opinion of you. You worry about whether they're going to take away your validation because they can. Okay. And the second part for me is those who of us who believe in this, mm -hmm. who really believe in this system and promote it as if it is, is um, you know, the creator's gift to... Um, um, I know this is sort of on the side. Cerberus. <laughs> Some of you have read mythology. Cerberus was a three-headed dog that guarded the gates of hell. When I look at Negroes, that's what I see. <laughs> and they have been given this power by Urugu to control who comes in. What we also forget is that Cerberus also guards the gate so that once you're in, you can't come back out. It's not just letting you in. It's also once you're in, you can't come back. So these Negroes have to ensure that those who are brought in have no desire and never will have a desire to go back, to return. That's a form of validation. And they receive their validation for, from uh, somebody else. So uh, this is, I guess this is a quick aside in terms of what we're trying to do here as, as warriors. Um, the job is to issue the warning, to tell folks about it so they can see for themselves. 
what is the proverb says, issue the warning, some will survive. And our community, um, ever since I can remember, and the things that I've read about, we are historically, going back before this place, we have always had this enormous respect for intelligence, for beautiful minds. We, we've always, always loved that. We've always appreciated that. We, we've always honored that. When you, when you look back, even in the late um, African empires or civilizations, if you will, the kind of money and prestige and honor that were given to the scholars versus the doctors and the lawyers and the rest of the folks. The scholars were some of the highest paid people in these societies, in these civilizations. And so we honored what people paid for books. When I was coming up still, there was always somebody in the community that people went to for advice, went to because of, of their intelligence. And it reminded me of um, um, Darren Clark, when mm -hmm. Anna Swanson said they called him Lil Fess, his short for professor. Mm -hmm. okay. I've never been in a community, and I've been around for a little while, but I've, I have yet to be in a community where there wasn't somebody who had the nickname of professor or doctor. I don't, I don't, I don't, I've never been in a community like that. We've always had that. Even when I talk to the brothers or when they write who are in prison, there is a professor. There's a professor somewhere. There's a doctor somewhere in that prison who's seen as the one who has, the, has all the knowledge. When I was in the military, there was always somebody in the dorm who was considered to be the smart one. And that person had that prestige, had that honor because of that. They took great pride in that. We have children who we look at. Uh, in the in the same way. Uh, so part of my point tonight, and what caused me to write this write this essay, um, we have people who look like us, but who do not work for our benefit. Oh, another point about these professors, these these doctors in our community who didn't have the credentials. A good chunk of their credibility went to how they applied what they knew to the benefit mm -hmm. of the community. Mm -hmm. Not just walking around, speaking all of this brilliant, mm -hmm. what have you, but no. Mm -hmm. It had to be directly connected to action within the community. Right. Okay. If there was not, if that connection wasn't there, then the person was essentially ignored, you know, uh, educated fool. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, the, and that's part of our tradition too. When you talk about wisdom in our tradition, you're talking about somebody, not just somebody who is wise, who's experienced, who knows a lot of stuff, who, 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 who loves to learn, but somebody who takes that learning and uses that to improve the quality of life in the community. Without that improving the quality of life in the community, then that person was not considered to be wise. We need to distinguish between intellectuals and wise people. There is a, there is a difference. Because there are a lot of people who have a lot of degrees. Uh, I know a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, but I know quite a few PhDs who are probably starting to idiots. Because they're not, you, yeah, quite, they're not <laughs> applying it in any way for us, and all that they speak for is speaking for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this, this started, this whole essay started years ago um, because, if you will, of Negroes. And I've, I've watched Negroes destroy people. Mm -hmm. I've watched them destroy people. Mm -hmm. I mean, their jobs, their lives, everything. I've watched them destroy people because of jealousy and because of fear of what would happen to them if they didn't do that. Just like I've watched adults destroy their children because of fear of how Europeans or Negroes would respond to them if their child mentioned such and such in school or talked about such and such in school. Um, when, when. Um, it really started for me when I started teaching at uh, Chicago State, which was a really, really wonderful experience because it's it's a um, it's a state school which makes the tuition. Well, I don't know if it still works in the same way, but it was a state school where the tuition was was um, doable for most black folks. All of the people in my class were old enough to be an aunt or my mother. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the students were <clears throat> black women, and they responded to me like I was a nephew, you mm -hmm. know, in a very respectful way, but like I was a nephew. Mm -hmm. um, and they um, loved my classes because I talked about us. Okay, there's, there's, 
there's a there's a way that you can teach anything that's us. Mm -hmm. I call it sociology by default. So I'm talking about us, but I'm inserting and explaining sociological terms to them without them having to sit there and, and memorize some definitions and try to get some examples that are completely, totally irrelevant to mm -hmm. their lives. So for me, really, Chicago State was my most fun um, collegiate teaching experience. And there they started calling me doctor, and I would tell them, I said, um, you know, in, in the PhD program, I'm not. Uh, the doctor, and they didn't care, and that took me back to the to the child uh, thing. So uh, when I got to uh, Morehouse, where they're really really uppity about it, you know stuff like that, whether you have your your degree or, or, or not, even though it wasn't an issue for us because coming out of the University of Chicago, that strikes a chord of fear in a lot of people who are an academic because they know what that produces. Um, but the students would all call me doctor, and I would repeat, I'm not a doctor. And I'd get up to do the, be asked to speak or something. Someone introduced me, Dr. Crawford. I said, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> um, this stopped. Two things happened that made me stop that. The first was I was speaking for, um, at an SGA function to a, a large group of students. And the guy, the SC president, he got up and introduced me. He said, Dr. Larry Crawford, and blah, 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 blah. And I got up and I took the microphone and I said, I'm not a doctor. I'm just, and he took the microphone from me. And he said, this is how we see you, so that's how we call you. I said, okay. And I'm going to hear what I had to say. Mm -hmm. uh, about two years later, a sister who I have an enormous amount of respect for, who is still teaching at Morehouse, in fact, um, brilliant. Um, she called me doctor. She she knows the protocol. So she called me doctor, and I said, I'm not going to say her name. Um, I said, you know I'm not a doctor, right? And she, <laughs> she, and she said, um, it doesn't make a difference in our community. We call it as we see it. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of end of um, that mm -hmm. discussion. And then I said, you tell me I've never called myself Dr. Crawford, Dr. Baruy, whatever. But it's like, you can't stop that. It's like you. It's sort of like you. You go on a stream. You, 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 every time you turn around, somebody's using it, and, and it's registering. Okay, that's how they see you. But they, Negroes, will take that and say that you said that, and they will say that you're lying, and they will try. So the, the whole, really, the whole thought behind this essay was to make sure that everybody was clear. <laughs> that, was, that was the heart, and she'll tell you, that was the heart of the essay. I don't want any confusion. I don't want any Negro stepping to me or stepping to somebody else or, or you know, saying that you're saying something that you're, you're not. So it was very much so to um, um, uh, straighten that out. Um, I have a, uh, put down a little list here. Uh, what we call those people who we respect in the community. Doc, Dr. Feds, Professor, Prof. Um, my own brother even would have, he still addresses my envelopes as doctor. Because they take, we, we take such pride in those people yeah. whose who mm -hmm. minds we respect. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we, we really do. And that's a good thing. And we've, we've only lost that as a result of being in this insanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we have we have really um, lost that and that's that's bad. One of the things that, that does is that it takes authority away from us. Mm -hmm. It takes our ability to define our reality and our world for because whoever they validate, whoever they give the credentials to is going to be speaking through their mind. Mm -hmm. um, how we should understand Credentials, how we should understand who is honored and how they are honored in our community based upon their intellect, based upon their, their, um, their love of learning, their love of wanting to know um, more about us, the, the love of wanting to know about other people so we can understand what happened to us and where, what we need to do in order to get out of this chaos. Um, this validation has to come from us. And I, I know I've been saying that all, all the time, but that's an extremely important point. You have to be powerful enough to be able to validate these people. Or what they say is not going to be respected by numbers of us who need to respect that. And you cannot, no, no part of that validation can come from someone else. 
Europeans are not validated by Africans in any area except maybe being cool. Mm -hmm. you, you, you white boys know that they're not cool, but if a black male says that this white boy is cool, that's the greatest validation mm -hmm. that he could, could ever receive. He knows he's cool now. Mm -hmm. And how do you learn, how, do you, how are you able to give that validation? Because you are supposed to be the authority on it. If you're not the authority, then you can't give the validation. So when we are allowing other people to validate us, that means that we see them as the authority. Mm -hmm. that's, right. that's why when people come to colonize a place, they don't change their language, they change the language of the people they're colonizing because that allows them to remain the dominant force in terms of how things are said, what is said, how thought occurs. They don't change that. We changed our language, we changed everything about ourselves to fit them, and it's never going to be enough. If it ever gets to be enough, it can never be enough. If it ever gets to be enough, then we become quote unquote equal. In order for them to remain supreme, and we know that's a lie, mm -hmm. but in order for them to remain supreme, mm -hmm. then they have to always be above us in terms of knowledge, information, ideas. Mm -hmm. They always have to be ahead of us in terms of what Bob Rumble says is progress. And they always have to be on the cutting edge of that. We can never catch up, because if we catch up, then they're no longer supreme. Mm -hmm. They're no longer on top of the game because they're no longer the authority. We become the authority, or we become the authority, and they lose that. Mm -hmm. And to lose that is to lose absolute power. Because mm -hmm. that's the real power, being seen as knowing all or having all the information, or being able to see into the future, what have you. That's power. Mm -hmm. it's information is power. I can dictate to you how this world is going to evolve, and you see it the way that I have defined it for you, and you operate accordingly. Mm -hmm. That's power. That's power. To be able to direct people's thinking, to be able to direct people's aspirations, to be able to direct, define people's vision. That's power. That's absolute power. And they say absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, but that's only when the absolute power comes from corrupt minds. Mm.